Uh, welcome to episode seven da, 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 of a screw loose. Um, we've been here seven times and you all have watched us. I don't know which is, uh, I don't know, more amazing. <laughs> so uh, we have our usual uh, disclaimers, but before I do that, I will introduce us all. So we have from British Columbia in Canada, <laughs> Kim Durrance. And we have from Georgia in the United States, Adam Petrie, and Pennsylvania, and I'll let you all figure out where that is. We've got Rachel Simon, <laughs> <laughs> and Connecticut. It's me, Sarah Stockton. Um, so we're so excited to be here. Our disclaimers are that our opinions are our own and not anybody else who you may think they may belong to. We all have different views, so you may hear us disagreeing at times. Uh, we might change our minds about any advice that we give you as soon as now. <laughs> <laughs> and please use this info at your very own risk. Um, we uh, <laughs> we only play re flute repair technicians on TV. No, that's not true. <laughs> 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 okay, so we have a ton of questions to get through today. Um, today is a, a episode that is uh, focused mostly on answering questions from our fellow repair techs. Um, this is a chance that I'd like to give one more plug to our Patreon. If you join by August 31st, techs, um, you'll get a chance to come and join us live on a special tech edition. Um, we have a bunch of techs from literally all over the world signed up already. You can get in on the conversation too. Uh, head over to patreon.com slash flute tech talk and sign up at our $10 a month level. And that is for technicians. Um, and we'll be talking about higher level things, doing demos, um, getting deeper into topics. Um, you guys will have live Q&A. You can ask follow-up questions. It's going to be a really fabulous thing. If you're a player and you're sitting there going, but what about me? I want to do something like that. No worries, because we've got you covered too. <laughs> so at our $5 a month level, you can join us and we'll have a talk specifically for players. Again, if you've ever wanted to like sit and say, hey, can you show me what happens when you shim a pad? Yes, we will sit here and shim a pad for you. I'd love to do that, actually. Yes, whatever you want. <laughs> Just we do it all day anyway. <laughs> yeah, we might as well show you. So um, please join us for that. And again, it's a live Q&A, so you can so uh, go back, do that again. Oh, wait, wait, why did you do that thing? And we'll sit here and we'll talk to you and we'll have a grand old time. We have a bunch of people already signed up for that. Um, it's going to be great. So anyway, patreon.com slash flute tech talk. And if you sign up by August 31st, you will be eligible to join us for those live conversations. It'll be awesome. Okay. Um, moving right into our questions because we have a gazillion of them tonight. People love your shirt. Great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> If anybody wonders, I, we've never explained this. The reason I keep looking down out of the camera range is because I'm actually the one that's monitoring Facebook. Yes. And thank you, Kim. Um, <laughs> these things. So if you see me kind of like looking down, it's, yeah. <laughs> Um, I will, I, my, my dear husband designed this shirt for me at my request. <laughs> he's magnificent. Awesome. He is magnificent. So I actually, I have a, a web store in which it is available for purchase. If anybody would like one of their very own. <laughs> Just cutting edge flute fashion you right know, here. It people. really is. It truly is. So um, anyway, I'll, <laughs> I'll put those in the comments after the show. But yes, this is one of the many reasons why I married the man that I married. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so let's get started. So um, uh, we actually had a lot of uh, our, our Patreon members asking us questions. So uh, our first one comes from one of our elite members, Christopher, and he says, as a technician, it is so easy to burn the candle on both ends, which can lead to all sorts of mental and physical issues. What are things you do to find balance between work life and personal time? So our order for this is going to be Adam, uh, Kim, <laughs> Rachel, and then me. All right, Adam, go for it. Um, I'm probably the worst of all of us to ask this question because <laughs> I am literally in counseling for this very problem. <laughs> Um, just because I do, I, I mean, like you see my posts at four in the morning and I'm like doing something. So anyway, I'm the wrong person to ask, um, baby steps and that's where I'm working on it. So it takes little efforts consistently throughout a day. So I don't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next. 
Kim, I think. Was it me? Sorry, I, so. I, yeah. I got distracted by so I, I, Yeah, it's you, <laughs> totally. It's all good. <laughs> um, gosh, this is the thing we talk about a lot, is like that work-life balance. Um, Pre-COVID, I used to do a lot of yoga, and I'd like to get back to that again. I think it's important to have something that's really different than the job that you do. Um, mm-hmm. and it, it just and taking like a couple seconds every day to just you know step outside. That's one of the things that I do is is step outside for even five minutes just to get a breath. Uh, yeah, definitely. Outside is great. And to that note, um, one of the things that has helped me feel like I am in control of where my time is going is um, actually I love to work late at night and people will be like oh no you're working at two or three in the morning I'm so sorry like well but you, but you don't know I do that so that during the day I can do all this stuff out in the sunshine that I like to do outside of flutes um and that that helps me feel restored um and I, I love working late at night um well <laughs> I like all of us I'm, I'm working on this. Um, one of the things that really helps me is that most weekends I get together with a friend. Um, every Saturday we get together and lately we've been eating outside because of COVID. <laughs> um, and we check in with each other and we literally go through our goals for the week, how we can support each other. Are we exercising? Are we eating, moving, sleeping? Like that's the thing that we ask each other. Are we eating? Are we moving? Are we sleeping? And if we can do those things, then um, we make sh- it makes things a whole lot better. Um, anybody want a free for all? Um, I, I mean, me sort of thinking back over like, what are the things that I'm working on? You know, because of I'm, we're all in the situation of self-employment, you know, it's about introducing elements of structure into your day um, and in your week. So for me, I know that every Tuesday night and every Friday night are a date night for me. And then most of Saturday is a date day for me. So I know that I always have those times that are carved out unless something dire happens. Um, And then Sundays for me are like a catch up day um, to either try to get ahead or or try to get caught up or to take care of like human needs. Um, But otherwise, like that's, those are the little basic steps I'm working on because I'm one of those people that'll go seven days a week for six months without taking a day Mm -hmm. off if you let me. And then I end up completely like totally crazy. So um, (laughs) yeah, I just get so overworked and so stressed. so yeah. it's tiny little things is what I find help me yeah. and I'm making progress. <laughs> I, think, I, think. I think part of it is like to do this job, you have to have this level of like not wanting to let stuff go and like mm-hmm. just you want to gotta get it perfect. Right. And, and so it just, it turns into this, like, if I walk away from the thing that I'm working on, then it's going to fail and I will never get it done. And so I get into this cycle of like, I don't want to stop working. And then it, when I've gotten into that phase of like, I've been working seven days a week, 14 hours a day for months. When I do have a day off, I literally don't know what to do with myself. And, and mm-hmm. that is terrible. Like I, I used to read all of the time. Right. So I'm, I'm also trying to put more structure into my life to like regain that, take nights off, take two days a week off. Like that's my, my big goal going forward is to make sure that mm-hmm. I really do get that time. One of the tricks that I use, and it hasn't worked, it hasn't worked over the summer, but that's, it usually doesn't work over the summer, but the rest of the year, um, is I schedule myself as a client. Uh, and that sounds really ridiculous, but it, it like, it's in my schedule. No one can schedule that time. I'll book like four hours or three hours. Um, and it's just this unmovable block and I do it randomly. Um, so that it, it sort of just appears, uh, and that, that helps me usually with like a little bit of structure too. Mm, Cool. Um, anybody want to add anything before we go on to the next thing? I know we have a lot of funny feeling we'll be talking about it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, Let's do a whole special on that one. Okay. I I, I think that we're going to be back and forth on this. Yes. Constantly. Yeah. It deserves its own show. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks, Christopher. Sure. Thank you, Christopher. Um, all right. Our another elite uh, Patreon member, Leticia, says, "I know this is probably very instrument specific or personal taste. Doing mostly student flutes or at most intermediate flute repairs and services, what make of pads do you suggest to use for this level of flute? Even pads for like a step up level flute um, that are at a higher level but not at Straubinger pad level." 
So what are your opinions, if I'm allowed to ask, for example, about Sony's Lucian Deluxe pads or JL Smith's Valentino pads, um, for instance, the E and the L series? Um, for this, we've got Adam, uh, Rachel, me, and then Kim. Okay, so for me, I get very few student and step up level instruments, like maybe one a year or less. Um, that being said, I have worked with all of the Lucian Deluxe pads, um, and I've also worked with the Valentino E series, but not the L's. Um, I typically just try to find something as similar as possible as to what's already in the instrument, um, which most of the time is the Lucian Deluxe, like the Wovens. Um, but yeah, I try to match what's there. Great. Uh, I have pretty much an identical approach. I, I prefer to stick with what the manufacturer has already designed the instrument for because most of the time that really is the most suitable pad for the instrument. And um, you're going to be fighting it a lot less and it'll be more stable for the customer. Done. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Unless you want me to like, go for a long time. Oh, yeah. That's cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> free flow. Same. I like to get my um, woven pads directly from Music Center in Italy. Um, the FL40s are great. Um, it's also worth noting that it's really important to get the right thickness just as much as it is to use the right pad material type. So like Yamaha's, for example, really like 2.2 millimeter. Um, they are just so much happier. So if you can get those specially ordered, then your flutes are going to be super happy. Pick those two. Um, I have not had Valentino products. I have not had them behave the way that I wish I could make them behave to date. So um, that's where I'm at on those. Yep. Basically, same as everyone else. Um, I think it's really important to stick to what the flute was intended to, especially for student flutes. Um, the one thing I would add is that it's important to get still a really good quality pad. So just because it's a student flute is not an opportunity to try to save 50 cents a pad and get something that's a lesser quality. Um, I also get mine directly from Music Center in Italy and their um, FL pads work great in student flutes. I actually just get the DFLs because they work great in everything, but don't, don't cut corners. Just get the right thing. Agreed. I know I'm over my 30 seconds. Uh, that's all right. I just started the free for all timer. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? But that's wanted? like really important. It's, it's, it's really important. It's one of the things that you don't want to um, be fighting the pad that you're working with. Mm -hmm. It will not pay to be cheap, especially in this instance. Yep. You know, even if you're just, you're working on the most basic flute, um, it's, you're, you're not going to save anyone by going cheap on the pads. And, and like sometimes people are concerned about like, you know, getting pads through like licensed dealers here in the States and all of that, but Music Center is willing to ship to the US and it's very easily done. They have such a wide variety of pads and other materials for that matter that are available. And most of the time, if I place all of those orders on the same day, the Music Center arrives first from Italy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always what I want every single time and they're just so consistent. Yep. Um, so if you have not used them as a vendor, I highly, highly recommend looking at, at their website because I get so much stuff there. Yep. And it's worth mentioning that um, don't try to set up like a, a business account with them because they won't do it. <laughs> so yeah. just order from the web page like anybody could order from the web page and it's it's the prices are competitive enough that it's really not necessary to, to they won't they won't do it anyway <laughs> they also don't have minimums so if you wanted to order say three one. pads or two pads or one pad of of the yeah. different lines so to experiment and see i i always recommend ordering more than one because like one is a one-off and you just don't know but like if you order like two of of a couple different of the pad um so like models it, it works great and then you can get an idea yeah, yes, so this is, is like my um, music center sample box in which I literally ordered one of everything just so I can see what they look <laughs> <Yeah>. like. <laughs> and sometimes, yeah. I'll, you know, some of them I ordered two because I knew I wanted to cut one in half and, you know, d dissect yeah. it and see what was in there. Um, but yeah, so now I know what every single, because they're, the what, descriptions on their website are pretty cryptic. Well, and those are all their English the original is way better than my Italian. Yeah, same, same. So 
the translation feature works mostly, you know, I, I can I can get an order done. But it's also worth mentioning that's the, the factory many like maker for the, of most of the pads that are in most of the things. So exactly. Cool. Moving on. All right. I lost my page. Sorry. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, our uh, patron elite member Alex says, can you please explain what is meant by key geometry and padding geometry? Is it just how the key cup is oriented to the tone hole or is it more than that? Can you also explain more about thinking about angles when padding? Are there any rules to follow? Um, so our order for this is going to be uh, Adam. I don't know why you're always first. I'm not doing it. I, and <laughs> then me. Always been third. <laughs> okay. Rachel. And then Kim. There's themes every week. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's like the gravitational tilt of the, I don't know. Okay, Adam. <laughs> okay, so this is something that I think about a lot. <laughs> because I actually redesigned like piccolo key work for how my instrument works. Anyway, like I'm just going to talk about key geometry. And this is just an old picture. But it's literally how the pad sits in the cup relative to the tone hole, and it's not only the thickness of the pad cup, it's the protrusion, it's everything all encompassed, and then it's also along with like keys cool. related to their siblings. Excellent. As a minor thing. Awesome. <laughs> all right, we'll, we'll free for all about that more. All right, so for my, my 30 seconds, um, it also has a lot to do with uh, how the pad is held into the cup and the compression of that pad, um, not on a piccolo, obviously, but on a flute. Um, and so, uh, and, and the protrusion has to do with the angle of the key, how it's approaching that, that tone hole. And then the protrusion can also affect the, the hardware that's holding it into place. So it's like this really complicated ecosystem that if you have an issue, you have to figure out which one you want to address onward rachel yeah and with um with piccolos it's it's so incredibly crucial to have even protrusion and you determine that with either the thickness of the pad and or the the thickness of the glue that you're choosing to use so that's a that's a judgment call that you have to make uh, to figure out what's gonna be the most stable and what the instrument can accommodate mm -hmm. that's all i got for now. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> i'm can so I efficient for a you are you are <laughs> Rachel's on like the 20 um, Just to timer. clarify, protrusion, just because we might, some people might not actually, that's how much the pad sticks out. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify what that was in case somebody's going, okay, what's this protrusion thing though? It's physically how much the, the pad sticks out. Um, for, I'm going to jump onto angles really quick. One of the things that for, for angles for padding is you have to think of how the shims are going to cause the pad to pivot in the key cup. Um, because it will cause all of this to happen. And that's one of the things that you have to keep sort of in your head. Cool. Um, Adam, do you want to continue? Um, well, well, I mean, without getting like into like all of this stuff and I've got more elsewhere, but basically when you are evaluating these things, it's important to realize that the protrusion of the pad, the way it sticks out of the key cup, Makers design for that to be absolutely uniform and looks perfectly flat all the way around. So, Ideally. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, I well that's what it. they're hoping for. <laughs> that is their goal. I think. So, as you get things installed and you notice that something is starting to look not level, it means something is wrong. And that's the place where you have to start. Mm -hmm. But it can, I, I mean, I have literally spent years on this stuff and it's such a complicated subject. Yep, it is. Um, so it's more a matter of what is an introduction to this subject and then getting into specifics after that because mm -hmm. you also have the, the pad geometry of, is the pad collapsed in the center mm -hmm. or is it being supported or, you know, how is the pad face shaped? Is it flat? Is it domed? Is, you know, so I have a little show and tell because I was yeah. Ooh, dealing yeah, sure. with this show and tell. On, on Can you the, make it big? big screen? Should I make it big? Okay. I'll yeah. Yes, yeah. please. Why do I have to remember how to do this every time? Uh, uh, spotlight. There we go. Okay. So um, this is the double G key of the flute that I'm uh, working on now. It came in for a repad, so I'm replacing the Strawbinger pads. Um, 
the reason why I had to repad this flute is because most of the Straubinger pads were ripping. And the reason why that they were ripping is because most of the pads were too, had too much compression in the middle. So that was putting too much pressure on the skins. It was getting pulled down. So basically what's going on here is that the pad protrusion, how much it sticks up above a cup rim, is taller than the spud and also the open hole grommet, like how they want to sit in the cup. So my choice here is I can either make the pad protrusion less by changing the angle of the key, which means bending things, which I don't want to do on this particular flute for a whole bunch of reasons, or I have to change the hardware that's holding these pads in so that the pads don't get overly compressed in the center. So the way that I did that is um, with this particular flute. Oh, I can't find it. Oh, here we go. So the original um, grommets that came with it, uh-oh, should I stop? Please go. Okay. Yeah. Um, the original grommets that came with it were these, and I replaced it with these. So if I line these up, you'll be able to see just how much taller that Delrin one is. Like, that's how much more height that that pad needed to be happy. Mm -hmm. um, and now I had a choice, though, even with this, in that this is an extra long um, bushing from Jim Schmidt, who is the man. <laughs> <laughs> he will make these for you. So another is, great product from uh, another great product. <laughs> <laughs> he can buy my shoulder. No. <laughs> so, We're banned. <laughs> so I had a choice with this in that this bushing is actually just slightly too long. The pad spins when I put it in. So I could either have chosen to uh, sand down the bottom of this extra long grommet to make it a little bit shorter so that it would like compress the pad just a little bit, or I used one of these handy dandy little um, Teflon pad seals. I don't know if you can see it. Anyway, it's there. yeah, so I put a little Teflon pad seal in there and that takes up the space. It makes it perfectly airtight and it keeps the pad from spinning around and with zero compression. So there's, it's not putting tension on that pad skin. Um, under the closed hole pad, um, I had to put, eh, I'll just show you. I make these little um, uh, circles to create space between the bottom of the pad washer and the top of the spud, because the spuds are too short in this flute. Um, so these I make on my little Cricut machine, which is what like scrapbookers use <laughs> to make little scrapbooking things. You can also buy them pre-made from some, some places, but it's just faster for me to buy shim stock and make this on my Cricut. Um, so anyway, so that's how I adjusted the height. I could have changed the spud. That would have been an option, but you know, this is a little bit less intrusive. Um, so anyway, so that's just the, with this flute, I'm making a lot of those decisions as I replace the pads because I want it to be as stable as possible for as long as possible. And I don't want the player to have to deal with ripping pads um, because it's not anything they're doing. It's the installation a lot of time. Okay, sorry, that was long. Well, that's, we needed that illustration of why it's not just straightforward to just make everything level. Like you have a lot of compromises to deal with uh, depending on the setup, like, like in your situation, it's not like you could just do the things you right. had to weigh everything out and figure out what the best course of action was. Yeah, and that's a lot of the time. We could do like a whole show yeah. just on geometry and setup. Yeah. Well, and sometimes you have sometimes you have to choose what's safest as yes. well. Like you have to make okay. choices based on I would ideally like to do this, but based on what I'm seeing on this particular instrument, mm -hmm. I'm going to do something that may cosmetically not necessarily look the way I want it to, which is kind of heartbreaking for us cuz we're all, you know, very you know, into this. Um, but sometimes we have to make choices where we have to tilt pads and stuff like that in a way that isn't cosmetically as beautiful, but is far safer for that particular key or that instrument in general. Um, so that's definitely a consideration that we do all day, every day too. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys want to? Sorry, what were you going to say, Adam? Um, well, I was just going to try to like put it as succinctly as possible, like what mm -hmm. we're talking about in a nutshell, and it's that we're basically talking about things as, as ecosystems within each other. Whoever said ecosystem, that was a great word. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> as everything that's happening care. in the pad cup relative to itself. And then you have the pad cup relative to the tone hole. And then that whole key relative to itself as it rotates around an axis, as it interconnects with its sibling keys. And that's kind of what how you have to build it out. You have to start at the most innermost part and work your way outward. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. And so sometimes that means stripping out all the stuff you just spent the last three hours on to start yes, all over again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
yes. Yeah. Or, or, or getting three hours into it where you're like, yeah, I'm making this flute great. And then you get hit that point and you're like, oh, that's oh, why they oh. did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Anywho, <laughs> shall, shall we uh, mosey right along? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, Will, who's also an elite Patreon member, whoop, go Will, um, <laughs> says, thoughts thoughts on burnishing versus other methods of head joint fitting on handmade flutes so we've got blue kim knee adam no wait blue is oh shoot no blue yeah. is me blue is you oh, just do it again <laughs> my brain just died okay kim <laughs> me <laughs> rachel and then adam <laughs> Woo! i used it all up on those GQs. Okay. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Kim. So I, I'm first. <laughs> Head joint fitting. Yes. Go. <laughs> Head joint fitting is kind of a lot dependent on so many factors, um, including the material. There's some materials that burnishing is can be really good on, and there's some that can be really dangerous on. Um, so I think that it's important to know your materials and be really familiar with all of your tools and how they react to those materials. That would be the... Uh, that's not really an answer, but it's really important. So be there first. Cool. Me. Okay. Um, I tend to, uh, I, I don't like burnishing tenons and maybe it's a case of familiarity. Um, I tend to use a traditional expanding tool on most things, um, but I don't use it. I think how most people use it. I, I, I tend to, I put it in my vise and then I like crank it till I just feel it stop and I back it off and then I turn the head joint and move it like a millimeter and then I crank it to this exact same spot and then I back it off and then I turn the head joint and move it just a teeny bit and I keep doing that all the way out so it doesn't leave a lot of marks and it goes very slowly. Um, anyway, onward. Is it me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I myself do, I burnish just about every head joint fit that I do. Um, but that said, I will see for every, say for every way that I've seen to adjust a head joint tenon fit, I've seen it done beautifully and horrifically badly. So I, I can't call out any one method as being the best or the worst with what I've seen. I've seen that it's all about the technique and the person who's doing it. So I, there's actually one method that I used to, I okay, got 10 more seconds. <laughs> there was, there was one method that I, that I thought like I could swear like, oh, that is just the wrong way. Oh, that's bad. Because I saw, I saw evidence where someone had really mangled a head joint doing that. Like, oh, well, I'll, I'll never do that. And then I saw like a master repairman show me how he uses it. And I was just like, it wasn't the tool at all. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I learned. I'm so sorry. That's all good. <laughs> Adam. Adam. Um, so I actually have a lot of problems in my hands and in my wrists. So I actually struggle exerting a lot of force. So I actually tend to avoid like burnishing just because it makes my hands really hurt. And if I have to do it, I wait till the end of the day because mm -hmm. after that, my hands are just done. Um, but I mean, I, I tend to go with the expanders and collet shrinkers first. Mm -hmm. um, I will use the burnishers, but I even have one of those saxophone like can opener things. Mm -hmm. If you all know what those are, um, very, very delicately, those are useful, <laughs> but they're dangerous. dangerous. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I've got to be desperate if I'm pulling that out. Yeah. Anybody want to uh, free for all? The one thing I'd like to discuss is galling. That okay. that's the subject, and then also like, I'll tend to go slightly too tight. Mm -hmm. And then I'll use a buffing wheel after I've okay. used the collet mm -hmm. because that'll make everything just really smooth and it just it just it has a certain feel to it. Mm -hmm. um, I really like. Um, I but, like I yeah. really, but you have to keep it super clean, or you're going to make a. Uh, we're go it's a segue into what Kim wants to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Um. I, the big thing it, with there's some materials that gall, which is like, you know, what's a and if it's like scratching and it will move the metal and then it started starts like coming up like a wave Balling, it's yeah. a disaster um and there are some materials that are extremely prone to galling um platinum is one of them i don't get a lot of platinum here but anytime i see it i always kind of like put a note in my head about whether it's good to fit um, also, the platinum infused metals, especially, be yeah. very careful introducing sandpaper, any kind of 
grit to those tenants. Yes, because it'll just start tearing itself up and I don't, it's really, really hard to backpedal and you don't know you've done something really scary until it's too late, to be completely honest. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it yeah, it, if you don't work with, um, Platinum Gold will do it as well. If you don't work with those materials all the time, call the maker and ask them how to do it. Um, there is, there's no shame in asking how to do something you don't know how to do to keep yourself safe. Mm -hmm. and especially um, the lower carrots. Yes, yeah. especially the lower carrot golds. <laughs> Be very careful, careful with lower carrot golds. Um, definitely don't jump into those without Particularly, having um, talked to the maker about them. <laughs> yes. 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 yes, specifically yes. burnishing because they're already very, very hard. They're, they're extremely hard usually and so and they're, and they're brittle and, uh, and the burnishing essentially work hard on them even more. So um, they're they more They can shatter. To, Fraction. Not just yeah. not to scare anybody, but um, <laughs> they can they can shatter. <laughs> cool. All right, moving right moving along. Right along. <laughs> <laughs> I never had that happen, um, but I did get warned directly from a manufacturer about it. So <laughs> I've just I've yeah. seen it before, and yes, I, it's I've, gnarly. I've seen it. I, yeah, it's not so cool. Um. All right. Rob, an elite member of our Patreon, woo, says, "Do you coat the head joint quirk with paraffin wax before installing them?" This is going to be me, Kim, Rachel. Wait, no. <laughs> what? I'm, I'm green. Say? I don't know. I know. Okay, me. Adam is yellow. Green is Rachel. <laughs> Blue is Kim. Right. We used up all the. Is that yes, right? we used up all all of the color logic oh earlier gosh, in the day. Apparently, I just can't. Okay. <laughs> um. Oh my God. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. I do indeed coat my um, head joints. Um, I use my handy dandy little um, lathe back there and I spin them and I melt the paraffin in and then I use the back of a sand piece of sandpaper to like burnish the wax in and then I make it all pretty and then I use cork grease and I insert it that way. And I actually have one of these flutes that I'm coa -ing. I put the cork in in December of 2016 and I still can't get it out easily. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent corking. So, yeah, like it, it, it keeps it nice and fresh. All right, onward. <laughs> That's um, I do use paraffin. Um, my bench butter setup is, is more like the, the ones that makers use where it's a, like a tiny lathe spindle and a chuck and a, a motor and a belt and all that. Um, but what I do is I just embed the wax while it's spinning under power then I just use my finger to melt it in and then I clean it off of the face plate. You use your finger? Yeah I just use my finger. It's hot. Oh man wow. I, I <laughs> mean like, like a spa. I grab stuff out of the oven without mixing. But um anyway I we've digressed. I want to, I'm claiming my 15 seconds. Um <laughs> When I was in repair school, I was taught then to like gently heat the tube to melt the wax onto the, the, you know, to make it seal and all that. I don't do that anymore because you'll never get it out again. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Rachel. <laughs> yeah, I only do that uh, paraffin trick where you heat the tube. If I have um, chronic crown tighteners that, that, when it tighten the crown too much and then it keeps pulling the cork out of position there or they might even directly complain to me like I don't want my cork to be able to move so easily and so that's that's a great way to help help that situation um but I don't arbitrarily put paraffin on uh because it's really in my opinion not necessary for a cork to be eternal the flute should be serviced before your head joint cork goes bad so um I do it if I don't want the cork to shift um if it's a situation where it's inclined to shift uh, I do paraffin here all the time. I always have, but I find it's especially important. Important. Um, I live on the ocean, so that's kind of a. Um, I don't melt it to the um, to the actual head joint itself, except for student mm -hmm. instruments, and that's entirely because they fiddle with them. Um, or if there's a person who plays really, 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 really wet. Um, I will sometimes melt it on, and it's because no matter what you do, they're going to get water up there. Well, and the other thing about the paraffin is even if I, I found that even if it's not melted to the tube, I, it does get kind of tacky, and it's rather mm -hmm. difficult to move unless you're, you're a, 
a flute repair person, you have the right tool to move it. And I do have professional players that like to be able to adjust that. Or what if they do find that they want to adjust it one day and they, and they can't really, and most of my customers are shipping their flutes in from far away. So mm -hmm. I prefer to have that flexibility unless it's a problem. Yeah. You put cork grease on yours though, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So like, just yeah, so, do. just to clarify, they're, they're not, not going, going in, in there. dry. They're not going there naked. <laughs> <laughs> correct yeah i just um, use standard cork grease I, for that yeah, yeah. I there's find, a lot of manufacturers who just use cork grease as well so that's most of them definitely, do, actually. yeah it's, it's, yeah they do I, I i prefer to i like to make mine seal just because i just don't know when i'm going to see the flute again like most, mm -hmm. most of my clients are really good about doing it every year but i just i don't know i'd rather i'd rather have that i'd rather have the longevity there and I've never yet had someone tell me that they were sad that they couldn't move their cork. So it's kind of the odds that I'm playing there. <laughs> and I don't, just to clarify, I also don't like purposely melt it into the tube. It just over time as it sits in there, um, does sort of like <laughs> get nice and nice and stuck. Um, yeah, for me, I only do the paraffin just because I have a thing about mold and I'm always worried that what if moisture yeah. gets in there and things start to grow. Yes. That's the only reason I do that over something else. Yes. Now, I mean, obviously, of course, it should be changed way before, you know, that should happen anyways. But, you know, I've, in my job that I had before I kind of went off on my own, I did clarinets as well. And a girl came in and said, I have had my clarinet with me in the Amazon rainforest for two years. And I scraped the jungle out of that instrument. Like you could see it grow <laughs> across the board. Oh, that was the scarring experience. Oh, that, God. It, like, I really don't think it, it's the huge difference either way, like the cork grease or the, the wax, but I just, I can't scrape yeah. the jungle. So that's why I do it. It is it's a, a neurosis of my own invention. Yes. Based on my experience. Yes. I, <laughs> Connecticut, for those people who don't live here, um, it, we get up into the like 90% humidity in the summer. So I have also seen my not jungle-esque, but green and slimy <laughs> corks. And it's, it's I'd brutal. rather not touch those. So I like to seal them. <laughs> can I do a quick add so we can answer sure. one quick question? Okay. Um, yes, shellac the top of, or glue the yes. top and bottom oh. of the, uh, yes, glue it in place. Please. Do not put them in dry. Do not, do not like hope and dream them in place. On the other please, hand, I do like please. removing those because they're nice and easy to get out. <laughs> well, that's because they've already moved and it's already again. Yeah, they already started to leave. That's <laughs> <laughs> a question that's come up a bunch of times whenever we talk about head joint mm -hmm. corks. So yes, please put shellac on the bottom, the both sides of the cork and put it in place yes. so that it doesn't shift and move because yeah, it and is I, really bad and if I've it heard does. people melting shellac on or whatever. I just use the liquid stuff that I use I just for use shims. the liquid stuff too. Yep. Yeah, and just, then you just wipe the excess off with a paper towel and keep I going. I have seen where people will use contact cement to do that, oh. but it becomes so extremely difficult to take that cork off and then to get the back of each plate truly clean. It, it's just going to save you a lot of time and it's really not that advantageous to use the contact cement. Full yeah. disclosure, that's how I learned to do it in the 90s when I was at Red Wing. And I, it wasn't it wasn't until I, I was studying with makers and stuff that they went, oh no, we use shellac because look, and they heated it and they came right off and that, that was enough to convert me in 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> having spent like the last 15 years of my life scraping off contact cement that I did to myself. <laughs> <laughs> but it does work. So, I mean, and I, last year I was in a situation where I was, I was doing a travel flute repair. I was in a hotel room doing travel repairs and I panicked because I realized I'd forgotten my liquid shellac and I wasn't planning on getting into anything too in depth, but I did have a head joint cork to do. I was like, oh my God, and I didn't want to put it in there and not glue it. And, and then so um, actually, I, I'm pretty sure I messaged you guys and you said, reminded me that I could use contact cement. So that, that bailed me out. In that instance. It's not that it's but bad. It's just not my first way choice. harder to deal with. Than yeah, exactly. it to be. The shellac is just way easier and a little dabble to you. I mean, yeah, it's just over. Anyway, okay, okay. carrying on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for indulging. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, pick me, pick me. Member Brian <laughs> says... 
Yes, we do have a pick me, pick me level for like three bucks a month. We'll, we will make sure that one of your questions gets asked. You don't have to show up for anything yeah. live, but we will ask your question on the show. <laughs> um, so he says, what are your tools slash technique preferences for expanding and shrinking tenons on student versus pro flutes? When, if ever, do you recommend the customer against fitting a different head joint to a flute? Okay, um, we've got me, green. Rachel, yes. <laughs> Adam, <laughs> Kim. Um, okay, so I kind of uh, uh, said this already. I, I tend to use the expander for most anything, no matter the level of the flute. Um, I have seen mushroomed head joints where someone used an expander on a, on a tenon that was too small and tried to put it into a barrel that was much bigger. And the head joint basically goes like this, and it's super ugly and like what does that do to the bore that the maker like so carefully shaped on their like three ton press like hmm. yeah. someone else can take over from there <laughs> oh i was just I, I was mulling over what i would do differently between a student or a pro flute i i don't really get i don't really work on student flutes so um i imagine i would do the same thing which i, I like to expand her for foot joint tenons and then i burnish the head joint tenons I have burnished foot joint tenons and it, it works if the metal's soft enough, mm -hmm. but if, if it's, especially if it's a harder material and I need a lot of elbow, I, it's hard to do on a short surface like that. Um, recommending against fitting a head joint to the flute, if it's more than a couple thousands, I usually try to encourage taping it instead um, with metal fitting tape. Adam. Um, yeah, I mean, I just use expanders, call it shrinkers and, and those types of things. Um, burnishing hurts my hand. I do have that saxophone can opener tool, which I don't know if some of you all even know what that is. I do. Hang on, hang on. That was one of those those there tools I was told to not use, yeah. but I've learned since is okay in the right hand. This, right. Now, it's this ridiculous. is different than the saxophone one that has the taper, the old can opener that's red. This is a different one. This is the better yeah. one for plutes. Yeah, I have one of the red ones somewhere. Um, but I use it so rarely, I'm not even sure where it is because it's dangerous. It will ruin an instrument, so. It will. Kim, wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, the biggest thing for me, um, I've said it before, I used to do a lot of rental, re rental like the student flute repairs, um, is that I used to separate out when possible the tools that I used for the rental fleet stuff and the stuff that I used for professional fleets. Um, or for professional flutes, and it was because the student flutes tended to have more um, scratches and damage in them. And I wanted to make sure that my professional tools were completely separate um, because the stuff that gets embedded in student flute plated head joints can take out your tools. Mm -hmm. And it's not such a bad thing on the like the nickel um, silver instruments because it's harder, but if you use those tools on both sides, you can really damage stuff um, in a, like a retail environment where there's stuff going back and forth and all the time. It's different now because I have complete control over my environment and the cleaning of my tools and stuff, but. Do we want to continue this thread or shall we move on to a new one? I think the next question. I think we've answered it, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Uh, you can't. Oh, the only thing I would say is there's there is a finite amount you can shrink head joints down. Yeah. Please don't shrink the living daylight. There are some head joints that you just. It's safer to wrap something to make it bigger than it is to try to crush something to make it smaller. Let's just go there. <laughs> don't crush anything. Don't crush the head joints. from so, us. And, and, it seemed and really it, important to say not to like. Yeah, for people who aren't flutists. It is a completely legit thing to tape a head joint tenon. Like it is a yeah. totally common thing. It is not cheating. It's it's like um, so we have this like silver and gold <laughs> tape. Mm -hmm. So I mean, literally just put cut the right size strip, put it on there. I tend to do it lengthwise. Um, some going around doesn't really work so well most of the time, but mm -hmm. um, lengthwise and then leave it alone. Like that's that's totally legit um, and much preferred to making that mushroomy thing happen or something dangerous. Um, and you can send, if something's really small and the owner is like, no, this is my forever head joint going onto my forever flute, you can have it plated up to size or you can have a sleeve put on it, but that's really something that I would, I would let a flute maker do. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, all right, onward. 
Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, are there any reasons to use brass stabilizers over plastic stabilizers? So this is talking about like under a pad that's thin and you need a stabilizer. Um, me. Lou. <laughs> Kim. Me. <laughs> Rachel and Adam. <laughs> Um, we're not colorblind, we're just color tired. I don't know. Yeah, color tired. Color um, tired. Yes, the brass ones come in thinner sizes than the plastic ones. <laughs> That's the main reason. Um, I, I, I have not, I've actually, this flute is the first one that I've ever put brass ones in only because I needed thin stabilizers for it. Now it turns out apparently only some of the keys. <laughs> but that's another story <laughs> um kim um oh gosh um one of the reasons to use um brass over the plastic is um on muramatsu boots specifically that are the lotus system there's a weight balance that goes on there so the muramatsu flutes with the lotus system which is the new system um all of the lotuses are uh a brass and so are the the um, stabilizers that go in, so you're balancing for weight as well. Um, so that that would be the one that I go. Actually, for. I need to correct myself in that these are aluminum, so they are actually lighter than ah, brass. Yeah. As you started talking about that, I was like, but these aren't. Oh, okay. oh right. <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> yeah, Colors. either aluminum or brass. Uh, tr for me, the main the main reason to use them is if you need something thinner than about. 40 thousandths because less than that or less than like 30 thousandths you cannot machine uh delrin accurately enough most of the time um and so like, if you order really thin delrin stabilizers you're going to find more inconsistency at that thickness um also at that thickness they will flex more and you know whereas okay. the metal ones you, you can depend on them to be actually stable and rigid so i use them quite a lot Adam. um the only thing that I really have to add to this is I had a client that um, sent their instrument back to the maker for an overhaul and then it came back and they're like, this isn't my flute anymore. I don't know what's wrong with it. And I looked at it and when they had purchased the instrument, they had Straubinger pads with plastic stabilizers and the maker had switched them to brass stabilizers and Pisoni S2 pads. Hmm. And it did make a difference to how it played and she could tell um so some players can can discern those things um so don't like change them out willy-nilly if they're already in there right cool um do we want to free for all on this or move on um the brass ones are nice but you can also solder them in um yeah if you need to like i once had a very very old flute that had the spud with the retaining washer that had to be screwed down yeah. and the, the spud was actually a threaded rod and they wanted to kind of update it a bit and it, the cup was just so deep and it was like shaped like a clarinet key cup where it was like conical on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, so I just soldered in washers and that worked really well. Cool. Nice. All right, let's move on. Um, do you ever use paper shims, even for the cheap student flutes with woven felt pads? All right, we've got Rachel, Adam. <laughs> I don't know why I'm having a hard time with this day. Me <laughs> and Kim. All right, take it away, Rachel. <laughs> okay, so yes, and also there are professional flutes with woven felt pads. Too. So my rules are not so much the grade of instrument, but more what type of cup design it has. Um, if, if, if I'm working with a, a stamped cup that, or, you know, that it's concave or has contours on the inside, definitely I must I use paper because the, the, plas the, the plastic shims just will not completely form, especially the, the thicker ones, and it'll just be a trampoline. Mm -hmm. um, all of what, wait, oh wait, that's not me. This is... Adam, go Adam, go. Adam. <laughs> um, the reason that Rachel said sort of the trampoline thing is why I've decided I'm going to invest in paper mm -hmm. shims because at the moment the only paper shims I stock are actually little piccolo shims. <laughs> which, uh, they're just these little oh, tiny you're just cute cute jars. Um, oh my but, goodness. But, 
Like we've already, I think we've had people asking um, somewhere about like a, a Patreon demo or something about Piccolo mm. Pet Shims. That's mm -hmm. the only capacity that I've used Paper Shims recently, but I have seen definite need to acquire stock because I can see how they are more useful sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you need the air horn. It's not just me. It's not just me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Apparently, it's catchy. <laughs> um, I'm so gonna keep mine short and and just say, like Rachel made me a convert. I only use plastic shims, and I am so happy that I switched to paper for my felt pads. I still use plastic all of the time on Straubinger S2s, like Back. synthetics absolutely so important. must be plastic. Never, ever, ever, ever paper on this. But under a felt pad on a stamped cup, especially, it's been like night and day for stability because the paper really can conform. And I actually wet the paper shims and like mm -hmm. make them into like paper mache in the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, Kim. Um, yeah, absolutely paper. Um, my sort of rule for paper versus plastic is if it has a completely flat um, key, cu a key cup, either because there's, it's machined that way or because it's got a stabilizer in it, then I will use plastic. Um, unless it's a student like woven pad, that doesn't really happen ever, but yeah. Um, otherwise, if it has a stamped key cup and I'm not using a stabilizer, then I will always use paper because of the conforming issues. Cool. Okay, is it the free for all yet? Yeah, it is. That's what I want to yeah. say. Okay, because I had lied you're earlier. A, you're a trendsetter, <laughs> you Rachel. Lied earlier. I gotta <laughs> say something. I did lie. Okay. Change your mind. <laughs> it's 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 an addendum. Okay, addendum to when Rachel said that she bases it on the cup design. Also, the other reason I decide on shims or the the other factor is um whether the pad has an airtight seal against the the, the cup. Skirt, mm -hmm. if you will, because um, no matter what the pad is, if it's if it's not designed to have a seal around the edge, I cannot mm -hmm. use paper with that. Um, so yeah, that that's both Straubinger pads, and um, I think at the Schmidt pad, I don't work with the Schmidt pads personally. Um, but the it's gold a ones you have issue. to use plastic. You have to use plastic. Yeah. yeah, and that is the reason why is because they're designed to not be a press fit in the cup, so water can, moisture can get behind. And get to the mm -hmm. whereas um belt pads are designed to be a press fit so are the lotus um, pads from muramatsu so they're allowed they're allowed to use paper okay that's it someone else can tell I, i'm good <laughs> do we want to keep moving we only um, have like seven uh, minutes left oh my gosh we have more stuff to say i know <laughs> can, can i can i say that that mixing paper and plastic is bad I, I know some people do it. I, I know that it, it's an old habit. I, I would like us to please stop. The paper and the plastic can um, swell and contract it with humidity and temperature differently, which means your regulation is not consistent. So the paper will swell and contract with the humidity and the temperature. The plastic will remain the same. And that means that the regulation that you worked so hard to put that hundred thousandth in there, mm -mm. Um, I see it a lot. Nope. <laughs> All right. Onward. Yes. Unless you were gonna, we're good. Mm. Okay. We're good. All right. Um, okay. So s since cork is slowly, um, losing favor in the industry, it is. Okay. Anyway, yes. is there an alternative <laughs> for the trills slash low D sharp foot corks? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, green. That's Rachel. <laughs> wow. Me. Okay. And then, <laughs> um, Kim did first part first. and Adam. All right, go, go, go. <laughs> it's okay. I'm I'm really glad that cork on the kickers is going out of fashion, like the key tails, because it's so stinking loud and obnoxious. I literally cannot even work on a flute with the cork there because it's so clanky while I'm like trying to pad the key and I just ah, I just can't do it. Um, but under the trills and the D sharp, I'm a total cork snob and always will be for life. So I cannot tell you um, an alternative for that. It's, that, it's me. Okay. Um, I concur. Next. <laughs> Kim. Who, who's next? Kim. <laughs> I don't think cork's going out of fashion, except for the kicker thing. That definitely needs to go. Um, I, I, 
don't see anything other than student splits who have anything other than cork. I've never seen that. Um, I think what you might be talking about is there are um, situations where we laminate felt or ultra suede or micro suede or some kind of other thing to the bottom of the trills or the D sharps to help make them less obnoxious. Mm -hmm. Adam. Um, I mean, I've never really used anything else under those three specific, you know, the trills and the, the D sharp, but um, the lamination that Kim mentioned, I like to do that a lot. Um, but, you know, should there ever be um, a shortage of, of cork in the industry, I mean, keep in mind, there are wine shops on every corner. You will not run out. <laughs> I've actually done that before, just for kicks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think this is inspired by a flute quartet I used to be in where wine was part of like the mid rehearsal break. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> and, and the problem is that wine corks are not as, they're, they're so porous. There's holes everywhere, but they're, it'd be really cool to have like the stamp on the side. Anyways, cool. this is really not relevant. The, um, I, I, I have to say though, I did get a flute um, fairly recently that had this like black neoprene stuff in the D sharp. And it was just offensive to my soul. Cork <laughs> <laughs> up. I mean, it up. I guess like <laughs> theoretically, there's like nothing wrong with it. But I, I just see like the synthetic stuff. It just breaks down. It gets powdery. Like who knows how it's going to interact with the silver. Like I, I just. The, it just ain't right. It just ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, with your fancy neoprene. <laughs> to, to put this maybe in a bit more context, I think that one of the things that this might be actually referring to is there was a number of years where there was a, a good quality cork shortage, mm -hmm. and it was very difficult to find nice looking cork, uh, uh, ugly mm -hmm. cork, plentiful, nice looking cork wow. that we wanted to work with was really difficult. It was a number of years ago. Um, and I think that, that that might be sort of why some companies initially changed to different materials. Thank heavens, because the new materials are so much nicer and quieter. Um, I think that what would happen, though, if there was suddenly like a massive cork shortage and we couldn't do it, I think the manufacturer would, would likely redesign the way the, key, the keys work there entirely, because you, it's really the only material that compresses enough to be safe. Yeah. Oh. Cork under kickers were specifically talking about flutes. That's all I had to say. I'm sorry, piccolos is totally acceptable and oh, yes, yeah, not too loud. Totally, um, totally yeah. different. We're talking about flutes. Totally okay, that's totally. it. We're just, yeah. Oh my God, we have one minute left. I know, I was just gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> so, our, and our last two questions are like really complicated <laughs> ones. <laughs> so oh, um, let's, um, let's just like favorite food. Let's, let's go. Favorite food, ready? <laughs> Here. I like this one. So, um, <laughs> so glad you asked. Uh, Rachel, <laughs> uh, me, Kim, and Adam. Pizza. I have never met a pizza that I didn't like. It, well, actually, I had one with anchovies on it once, and that was a bit much. I still picked them off, and I worked <laughs> through it like a winner. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess I like pizza. Cool. Um, <laughs> uh indian food like sog paneer specifically mm. like oh i could eat that like oh, all day and like mango pickles like oh yes please yeah i have no self-control with that um all right <laughs> kim <laughs> i'm gonna do something that both of you didn't do i like ethiopian food um it's it's awesome and i have fond memories because when i was visiting um, um one of the, the makers and factories and stuff like that. Um, well, not really factories, but anyways, um, we went out, <laughs> it doesn't matter. We, we went out for, for Ethiopian food. So I, I have fond memories of it. So I think it's 50, 50, it's, it's lovely, but it's also, it always reminds me of the people I spent time with there. So Aww. it's kind of one of those things. Yay, Adam. Um, <laughs> well, for me, it's often what I'm eating at the time. So tonight it was Chinese takeout. <laughs> um, oh god i mean like kind of like rich said i've seldom met a pizza i didn't like either or a bottle of wine they go together too they do they do it's like the italians are onto something man they are, 
we've all had like unbeknownst to each other ordered pizza the exact same night on enough aqu- yeah. uh, enough uh, occasions that it's it's sort of a theme. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, true story. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a awesome. thing. All right. Well, I think on that note, we're... <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> <sighs> so, um, next week i think we'll be back with uh, uh one more regular show and then the week mm-hmm. after that will be a special patreon show so uh, feel free to join us yes. on Patreon so we can like actually talk to you that would be awesome um mm-hmm. so next month we start our, our patreon for realsies so we're going to do two free shows just like we've always been doing just like this so you'll get the benefit of us if you're like strapped for cash or just don't like us that much that's totally cool <laughs> <laughs> i mean impossible, right? impossible. okay <laughs> <laughs> anyway if you do want to join us we'll be on the patreon for the other two weeks of the month and we hope that you all have a fabulous night and we will see you all next week so, see you soon thank you Thanks for bye